You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. We are gathered here as advisors, as scientists. The kind of place we expect a ghost to like to wander around. Hey, we all know that we're going to die, baby. I'll help you. I'm something of a witch. Welcome to Mission Spooky. I'm your host, Cord, substituting for the absent JC, and also cryptid enthusiast. And I am joined, as per usual, the queen of everything, Kiki. It's very awkward, but anyway. Uh, it is awkward. <laughs> hey, JC is not here, but we are absolutely thrilled today because we get to welcome the prince of paleo fiction and the author of the best selling Kronos Rising series, as well as his new book, Monsters and Marine Mysteries, Max Hawthorne. How are you doing today, sir? I'm a little on the chubby side, but I'm <laughs> happy to be here. And since <laughs> this, this is not video, and the camera doesn't <laughs> add 10 or 20 pounds. I'm feeling a little good. Join the club. Yeah, you know, things are bad when you're happy people can't see you, you know? <laughs> Same. <laughs> I mean, when I walked by my scale this morning and it shivered and tried to hide, I knew something was wrong. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, oh, God, he's not gonna, he's not gonna. Oh, sh-. But anyway, so yeah, happy to be here. So we just covered Pirates of the Northeast over the summer, and there were two subjects that I wanted to cover, one of them being sea serpents slash ocean cryptids. And I'm so glad that I waited so we could get you on the show to talk about monsters and marine mysteries, because that book is great. Thank you. So what can I do for you? Ask and I shall answer. (laughs) Well, see, first of all, I have two compliments. Thank you for actually having your work cited because believe it or not uh the very last pirate that we did for me was an absolute nightmare because half of the quote works that were cited it's actually kind of comical if you go back and listen to it but it was pretty terrible and one of the things i love about having this book on i I did purchase it through kindle because you can follow along and you can just click on the news articles or the website that was used or this like a Nat Geo article for the one thing. And then I thought that was awesome. So yeah, the Kindle version, I mean, I wasn't aware when I added the links, all the references and, and citing and stuff uh, throughout the, the, the work uh, that that was an option. But as they were formatting it, they showed me and I was like, wow, that is incredible. I mean, you can, obviously in large images and things like that if you want, but the fact that you just go boop and it takes you right there, you don't have to research, you don't have to, you know, what's that URL that's so so fine print, you know, I can't see it, whatever. It just did everything for you and it made it that much easier. And by the way, since Monsters and Marine Mysteries came out, this stuff keeps coming. I, I mean, it didn't make it in the book, but of gosh, a few months back, I spoke with a photographer, an underwater photographer. He films great whites underwater. That's his specialty. And he took photos of an 11 foot female named Seabatch. Uh, for some reason, the uh, UK newspaper that put her in there, they upped her size to 15 feet for some reason. Mm. He said he doesn't know why, <laughs> but she was an 11 foot shark. But you know, I guess that, you know, they got to exaggerate, but she had an yeah. enormous bite scar on her side, on her, I think it's her left side, going from her gills all the way past her dorsal. Huge, with two scars, individual two scars. So this isn't something that happened when she was young and that it grew magically with her and maintained its shape and the two marks grew and everything grew perfectly, symmetrically. Right. She was, you know, smashed by a much, much larger white shark. And I was able to you know, speak with him at length and get all the references and such and then do the number crunching. and. Once again, as you saw in the book, I like to be as conservative as possible. I mean, I'm not given to sensationalism or Godzilla-sized things, as they say and stuff. And uh, using the most f- conservative elasmic branch formula out there to crunch numbers based on bite width for white sharks, her attacker was over 28 feet long. Holy Jesus. Now, that's a very, very, very <laughs> big white shark. I mean, we had the white, wow. the white marks, and I'll, I'll be putting out the color images soon from the Beast of Briar Island, and that one, that animal had white marks over 27 by 37 inches. 37 was the height on a whale carcass. 
and those were fresh bites. Mm. And that indicated a 26 footer. Sea batch's scars are even bigger. So oh my God. that was something. And then even more exciting, did you read the mega sh shark chapter with the, with the whale shark that had been attacked? Yes. Okay, so that shark, the whale shark, was 40 feet long, solid, which is big. I mean, they got bigger ones out there, but and I, I mean, I, I talk to Simon Pierce regularly, the one who photographed it. He's the marine biologist, and he's in, in charge of the uh, marine megafauna foundation and such. So this guy knows his stuff. That bite, which if you look close at some of the photos, still shows tooth grooves, chomp, 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 is four feet across, which is astonishing. But what's more astonishing is we just got recently, in the last couple of months, a sub-adult humpback carcass that came ashore, and it had a bite on its left ventral region, right in front of the tail, like in the peduncle region there. And that is the same size and shape as what struck that whale shark. Imagine that. Yes. Uh, no, because that's almost as big as, I I'm, well, I'm only four foot 11. So I'm like, yeah, that's a four foot big. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, the number crunching suggests a 42 foot animal, an attacker. And I had my guy go check around the edges of the bite and there were individual tooth punctures. And he was able to measure some of them. And the crown was three inches wide, not deep, wide. Okay, so I'm working on a special that's coming out. I'm going to do like a little video documentary. It's already in the works for this. But this basically, I mean, strongly suggests that that whale was killed by a gigantic macro predatory shark the size of a bus. And uh, I mean, it just happens to be what it is. You know, it's crazy. She was apparently hit by a ship or a boat first, though. Wow. Yeah. She had a broken shoulder blade. It was fresh. So I think that because, you know, sharks that size are very slow. See, that's why that if you saw that whale shark, even though it got struck like that and bitten, it didn't get killed. And whale sharks only swim at five miles an hour. So how could the attacker not finish her off, you know? Right. So, I mean, a sub-adult humpback would be able to top at it. I think it's 22 or 27 miles an hour. I forget the numbers. So a giant shark, if one existed, wouldn't be able to readily catch that whale fit unless it caught it off guard but if she'd been hit by a like a big boat or something like that and she was already busted up and couldn't swim much she was an easy target and i think that's what happened there it's all going to be in the, in the thing we're working on and stuff but you know none of this that stuff didn't make it into monsters marine mysteries but there is tons in there already about everything from squid the size of you know small ships to octopi like that would like be able to take down a whale to you name it okay so speaking of the octopi mm -hmm. i've heard you tell a story about two fishermen who are explaining how their vessel got kind of uh, i don't want to say yeah i was saying not attacked <laughs> just probed yeah would you mind regaling our listeners with that story because that's this boggles my mind i, I love octopi by that's like my favorite creature honestly well um they, they are incredibly intelligent i've i've caught them accidentally while fishing like in Hawaii and uh getting one them off the hook is an ordeal because they you know they, they don't <laughs> readily realize you're trying to help them and removing a hook with a barb is painful so I end up like taking like many wire cutters and snipping off the barb so the hook can come out painlessly but I mean you peel one arm off your arm and six more <laughs> grab onto you you know it's, <laughs> right. you, you can't win that battle because you're outnumbered see so but I, I, I love octopuses but uh, so what happened was it was Demetrius and two of his friends, and they were down off of in Florida for his birthday. This was a couple of years back, I think 2013, if memory serves. They had a fishing charter out of Sanibel Island, and which there's been uh, some a few things have gone on down there. The boat, I think he said it was either a 50 or 55 foot fishing charter, and they were drift fishing using some sort of cut bait or something, which Demetrius described as being incredibly foul smelling. So I don't know, it was you know whatever dead chopped up fish they were using for bait and him and his friends were fishing off the side of the boat they were doing what's called drift fishing uh, that means the boat's moving along with the tide and your baits are down near the bottom or on the bottom and you're dragging along until you encounter something that's hungry and grabs your bait like you do that for fluke and flounder and halibut yes. and stuff like that so what happened is apparently the uh quietness of the boat you know just creaking along and this foul smelling stuff that they kept putting in the water attracted something to their fishing vessel and they said as they stood there the funny part is he told me this story he didn't think anything of it because he thought octopi always are, get this big when he told me the story okay <laughs> so he was yeah. stunned when i was like whoa whoa put the brakes on rewind tell me this again okay <laughs> he said yeah we were standing there and then an octopus's arm came up to the surface 
and sort of reaching toward the boat and then it started touching the boat i'm like well how big was this arm he said well the part we saw was like 30 feet long and i'm like 30 Whoa. feet long and i said <laughs> wow i said that's impressive I said, uh, are you sure it was an octopus? He goes, oh, yeah, when we went back to shore, we went into the library, and these guys are older guys, so that's their style, and they pulled out books and stuff, and they, they compared the arms of octopi and squid and cuttlefish and all this stuff, and it was 100% an octopus, but anyway, it's kind of smooth skin, reddish brown on the top, and whitish underneath and all that. He said it was ranged from two to three feet in thickness. Now, that was astonishing for me to hear that. Ooh, well. If you think about it. A yard foot thick tentacle at the end of a 30 and that's you're not seeing the whole tentacle see so the tentacle had come up from the bottom and then it came on the surface and it reached towards them and it started touching the side of his boat and they were 20 feet from it it was like right to their right and they were all looking at it watching this like oh there's something you don't see every day a <laughs> arm the size of a telephone pole you know just kind of probing us and uh so like he goes, but we figured it was just curious, and then it lost interest, and it withdrew, slowly went under, like that. And he said when that happened, they looked down, and they saw all the other arms, like the shadows, a silhouette in the water, and they saw the shape of the body. And they, they estimated that this thing was between, I think he said 80 or to 90 feet in length overall, including uh. the tentacles. Okay? <laughs> now, that's not stretched out, like, you know, doing a full split. That's mantle to tentacle arm tip octopuses don't have tentacles officially but anyway and then it just moved right. off very quietly etc as they watched they saw this like a silhouette and he said it was something to see because it was bigger than their boat so i told him i said well you're very lucky because you see what a lot of people don't know is that an octopus has what's called chemoreceptors in its suckers you know the suction cups and chemoreceptors means that's like taste buds for you and I. So they can touch something, and they can tell what it is. They can touch it. They can sense it. They can taste it, smell. It's going to all kind of worked in. And so this animal apparently was trying to see if the boat was edible. I suspect that it thought it was a sleeping whale, and it was sure. And before it attacked, it wanted to make sure. And then when it touched the fiberglass that the boat was made out of, it realized, oh, this isn't edible. And then it withdrew and it went on its way. But if it had made a mistake, let's say they had a lot of chum in the water or something like that, and it was fooled, it might have slammed into that boat and wrapped its arms around it. And then it would have realized quite quickly, especially if it tried to bite, that this is not an organic thing. God forbid if it had grabbed a person by mistake, it might have said, well, you know, hey, Here's an hors d'oeuvre, you know? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but that's basically what they told me happened. I have no reason to doubt them. I mean, I interviewed the hell out of, the, you know, the guy to make sure. And, you know, I set traps for people when I interview them and see if they'll contradict themselves and all sorts of things like that. But uh, there were three people. And then what was also interesting is he told me that when they got back to shore, they called, I believe it was the harbor master they spoke to. First, he said it was the Coast Guard, but he wasn't sure. I think he ended up being transferred to the harbor master. And they told them that they saw this immense octopus and he said that the guy he spoke to said oh yeah we know about it. it's it been here for like three days now <laughs> what what yeah, that's what he said that's what they were told okay it's been here for like three days now and somebody else reported it and whatever this type of stuff and so i'm like wow really seriously and he's yeah yeah you know and so they were kind of like brushed off or whatever and again this i'm going by what he said I mean, I have it all, like, this is all transcript because it was all, like, messaging back and forth. And then, like, what was odd is that the, there was an incident right around that time. I don't know if it was before or after Demetrius's. I think it was after. On Google, it's, it was in the book. I followed up with it also and interviewed the witnesses. Um, they called it the Sanibel Sea Serpent. And what it looks like, mm -hmm. and there was a video shot of it, is there's manatees on the surface. And all of a sudden, something grabs one of the manatees and yanks it under. It doesn't come back up. So, um, and the, the people filming it are quite scared, especially the, the woman. She was cursing and screaming at her the fiance to get out of there and stuff. I spoke to him at length on the phone, and he told me that this thing passed under their boat. Now, this is close to shore at Sanibel. They were only in, I think, 20 or 25 feet of water there. But he said that he mm -hmm. saw it go under the boat, and what he saw go under the boat does not match size-wise with what Demetrius and his people saw in terms of like overall, less like something got lost in the translation. But the guy that with the Sanibel one, he said that it was a 40 foot long mass that passed at high speed under their boat and was headed for the manatees. And then he said when it got close, 
a part of it shot out like a telephone pole, like that, wrapped around a manatee and yanked it under. A young manatee, in fact, not a full-grown one, if that matters. And he described the, the width of what passed under their boat as being, I think he said, four feet thick. And what shot out and went after the manatee was narrower. So I surmise that it's possible that what hit the manatee could have been an octopus. It could have been a squid. Both of them kind of behave like that. You know, when they're traveling, like jetting backwards, they have a relatively narrow profile compared to their length. Like if you had a squid that was four feet thick, that's a gigantic squid. Picture a squid four feet yeah. off the ground lying on, you know, you know what I mean? Like mantle just being four feet thick is, you know, that's a cross section, okay? But Arcatuthis has these dual clubs, these actual tentacles, which are together and that shoot out at something and grab it and latch onto it. They have teeth in the suckers and then yank it towards the animal and then the arms will latch onto that and it starts to eat it alive. An octopus can jet backwards also and could, of course, shoot out a tentacle as well. You know, it would, wouldn't be the same technique. It would just be like grab, like that type of thing, but they're very fast. So it could have been either, in my opinion. I mean, obviously we're relying on testimony, but if you look at the Sanibel footage, you can see this something wraps around this manatee and pulls it under. Now, some people have tried to dismiss that as saying, oh, that was just a manatee rolling on the surface and stuff. But I went through the footage frame by frame by frame, and you can actually see this thing wrap around it, and then you see it yank straight under. And then you'll see the manatee's tail to the left, I think it is, as it's pulled under, flailing. And then a split second later, its head pops up like it's desperate for air. And then it gets pulled under again. And then it's gone. So the, let's just call it the, the inertia or the, the, the force downward pull that was generated there is not suggestive of an animal rolling on the surface when I get it. It looks like something literally gets yanked down, is fighting for its life, trying to breathe, pulled under, that type of stuff. And what was also interesting is uh, the witness just told me, uh, he said that the footage when it was put on YouTube was uh, somehow changed, according to him. Like it was HD when he had it, and when it appeared on YouTube, it was like a lower quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, when I was working on the frames and choosing frames, you know, that they gave me permission to use for the book, I would hit the enhance button on each still. And when I did that, something very bizarre popped up. And that was called fogging. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, like when somebody's like testifying against like a, a criminal and they pixel out their face and they change their voice and stuff like that. So it looked like that had happened at a bunch of key frames when this strike, we'll call it, takes place. And it's not my imagination. I mean, I put samples in the book of it to show there's like yep. squares that are fogged and they didn't show until I hit the enhance button. So it's like they're they, they're not there normally unless you improve the image. So it's to me, it looks like they were very well done to subtly kind of like conceal stuff. That's what my impression is. That's what I believe. Okay. So I'm watching the YouTube video now and it definitely does look like lower quality <laughs> for sure. It looks like the frames are really low too. Like Yeah, if you, you guys have a, you know, a copy of the book, and even in the black and white images that are in the book, it's in there. You know, I put a bunch of frames in there and I point, I have arrows pointing where it shows where the sections are fogged. So you won't see that on the YouTube version because it's low res, but you also won't see what the fogging is covering. So it's kind of diffused. But when you improve the image, then you see stuff has been blocked out for some reason. I don't know why, you know. If I had to guess, I would say it would be something that would expose that something, that, that, that it's not a manatee and then something grabbed a manatee and was, you know, made a meal out of it. That is definitely an interesting video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you, when you look at it, can't you tell the thing seems to go, like, get pulled? It goes from, like, not moving at all to, like, really quickly getting jerked. That's what it looks like to me. I mean, if you hear her, like, freaking out, she's like... She's like, what's yeah. that? What's that? Get out of here. You know, there's some expletives, obviously. We don't have on the air. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, so I found that interesting. Let's put it that way. You know, especially since this was happening at the same time and Demetrius, as people saw, a 30-foot tentacle probing their boat. Is this close to the same area as the octopus story? Yeah, I think that it's the same island. I think Demetrius and his guys said they were, like, maybe three miles offshore or something like that. Interesting. But, I mean, uh... You know, Kiki's got Monsters and Marine Mysteries. You could look at her copy, and you can see the individual frames. I've already bought the book. I'm waiting for it to get delivered. 
he bought yeah he bought the physical copy i bought the Kindle uh, version. yeah because i i'm in a situation where i don't have enough room for yeah. books because i used to be a borders manager back in the day so i have uh, like a ton uh, of books. a little background for me because i don't know if i even talked about this on the podcast when i was in high school mm-hmm. i wanted to be a marine biologist so i could go look for like the giant squid <laughs> There like that's why I was like, "Ooh, this is the subject we're doing today. I'm interested. Let's go." <laughs> well, Simon has the life, in my opinion, because this is a man who gets to swim with, for example, whale sharks the size of a bus, like pregnant females, and not just tag them. He'll give them sonograms while he's swimming with them. You know? Wow! I mean, it's that's, like something. Yeah, that's so cool to me. But think about this. So now you're down there, and you got this 40 foot cow whale shark with a four-foot munch mark on her flank. Wouldn't she be looking over your shoulder going, I wonder what did that, you know? And is it around here <laughs> anywhere? I mean, oh, think yeah. about that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I hey. remember as a teenager being at Fairmount Park, and I came across uh, what I assume were black bear claw marks in a tree about seven feet up. And I just thought it was a good time to get out of the woods, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... That's a good, it's a good deterrent. <laughs> Don't come this way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's how they mark their territory. And they also show how big they are by how high they reach. And, and mm-hmm. so me and my brother, we were like, you know, those look like bear claw marks. Really, that's just, you know, and we call it a day. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, if you were, a, think about Man. it, if you were a pirate in a sailing ship, you know, any sailing ship, and you encountered an octopus that was 80 or 90 feet long, and it impacted or squid that size on the side of your vessel and started grabbing onto it, it would be quite a scary thing. I would think that people back in that day, probably a lot of them, before they go out in the ocean, probably never even heard of an animal being that size. Mm -hmm. So to see something like that and not be able to actually see it, just see like an arm poking out of the water or something, just like, oh, oh no, (laughs) I made a terrible mistake here. And they, it's, it's, you've got to keep in mind, these are intelligent animals. I mean, the octopus is, in my opinion, mentally far superior to the squid. But, I mean, there was yeah. that incident during World War II where there was a bunch of British uh, sailors on a life raft. And a giant squid was stalking their life raft. And it kept stealing survivors. It's, I think it snatched two or three people, one a night or something. It was on um old series from the 70s. Um, oh, In Search Of. It might have been, yeah. What's it's the name in of search it? Of? Arthur C. Clarke? Oh, oh gosh. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's... Yeah, so he had the survivor on there, and he showed, like, on his legs or something, like, they, they had all tied themselves together, because they realized, like, you know, they wake up in the morning, and John's gone, and the next time Steve is gone, and where what's going on here? And so everybody tied together, themselves together, and then the guy woke up screaming in the middle of the night, and this enormous squid is trying to pull him over the side of the boat to make a meal out of him and they jumped the squid and i think they managed to cut off like its arm or part of its arm and drive it off but he had permanent scars on him like an inch and a half wide or something where this thing's suckers with those teeth had sunk into his flesh and permanently lacerated it so you know that's proof positive that they will eat people it was arthur c Clarke's mysterious world by the way cool because it was going to yeah. drive me nuts if I didn't look at it. Because I know exactly yeah, what you're was... talking about. It has the crystal skull in the beginning and all that. So I was like, ah, I've seen this a million times. I mean, that's uh, the, the cephalopods can be quite unpleasant. I mean, you, yeah. probably, you if you read the book, Kiki, you know the part where the, that lighthouse keeper, he watched a squid kill a humpback whale calf and take it from its mother? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, mean, so. I don't, yeah. I would not want to mess with uh, When you're talking about like a squid, like hunting those yes. guys, and I know exactly what you're talking about. It's... That's creepy. Like, you, can't, what are you going to do? How do you battle that? Even when you take into consideration, like, recorded species, I'll say, like Humboldt squid, they're only a couple feet long, but they're still even dangerous because they're so nasty. They'll just eat anything that gets close to their mouth. Diablos Rojas, the red devils. Yes. Imagining that, but just exponentially bigger, is, just mm-hmm. doesn't ever seem like good news. <laughs> Guy from Shark Week. Brandon, we were on a Zoom call like a year or two back, and all, and he was attacked, I think, by Humboldt's diving and stuff at one point. 
Uh, investigating them. Brandon McMillan, I think his name is. The guy that used to host Shark Week all those times. That yes. sounds right. Brandon McMillan. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Yep, yep. So, I mean, that's some scary stuff. You've got, yeah, a horde of five, six foot squid trying to drag you down and rip you to pieces. Yeah, that's. Mm, no, thank you. Yeah. It's a bad day. That's a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Calamari bites back, you know? Because <laughs> there's, there, there's no way you're outpowering like more than one and they'll, they're literally traveling like swarms oh and by the way you were right about the slight philadelphia accent kiki you see originally <laughs> I was born in brooklyn and then when i was a couple years old i grew up in philly and then after college i went back to brooklyn so my accent was kind of really confused you know i had like philly accent then i had the brooklyn accent and now <laughs> i'm just sort of like making up accents as i go <laughs> it's great i can hear at least a strong new york influence you know, it's funny because, I mean, the Cronus Rising series, like they call me the, quote, master of marine terror and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, all that. Because the books, the whole series, I mean, there's I think, seven or eight books out now, are kind of primarily based on prehistoric marine life in the water and the water. Then that's a Philly accent right there, water, okay? Water. Yeah. That's water. what I heard, yeah. actually. That was what I heard when you said water. I was like, wait a minute. Did he? Is he from there or around there? Or my my brother Mike want to fight? <laughs> 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 my point was is that I, I do a ton of research for all these books, so I'm not a yeah. marine biologist. I mean, you know, it's, I'm sort of an avocational paleontologist because I do paleo theories research on my own, that type of stuff. But the whole marine thing is, I've learned everything I learned, like about octopi and things like that, just from all the research I've had to do for all my novels. So I've dealt with prehistoric creatures like pliosaurs and mosasaurs. I, I've had monster squid in the books. I had an 84-foot megalodon shark named Ursula that was in the book. And I've had these two ginormous octopuses, uh, the uh, octopus gigantus from the abyssal depths of the ocean, a male and a female. They were sort of like a married couple. And I had them through the whole Cronus Rising Kraken trilogy wreaking havoc and was just like Armageddon for sea monsters while trying to keep it potentially realistic. We're not talking kaiju stuff, you know, but a 200-foot right. octopus is still one heck of an octopus. And my octopi were special. You see, I wanted the, you know, like lots of people in movies and stuff have had monstrous octopuses in them. War of the Gargantuas, several King Kong movies, tentacles. I mean, there's been a lot out there. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I thought, okay, so I've got this species of octopi that live in the ocean abysses where it's frigidly cold. And they've gotten this size because of what's called abyssal gigantism, meaning sometimes animals that aren't warm blooded that live in cold environments are able to grow to incredible size because of that. They live longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these ones, I had it set up where they preyed on whales and they were ambush predators that lived in the ocean abysses. So when, and it's in the it's in the book, in the Cronus Rising Kraken 1, in fact, a pair of bull sperm whales are diving down and they get attacked by one of these things. And I have it where it's part of the whale's culture. And they know when they go down hunting for squid, if they go too deep, you know, too far, certain places, sometimes they don't come back because there's something down there that's sometimes bigger and badder than them. So in order to make the octopuses not just huge and intelligent and demented and what, but to make it logically like a, what's it, a suspension of disbelief to make it uh, palpable or believable for the reader. I gave them the ability to exude a molecular acid through their suckers. According to the backstory, this is to label, enable them to grab onto slippery prey like whales and burn through the skin so they can get a death grip and the cetacean can't escape. But it came in handy when they were attacking this research facility and melting through steel doors or grabbing people and they were people were dissolving in their grip and stuff like that. It just made them more <laughs> terrifying. Oh, man. You know? So when are we, when are you, has this been optioned for a film yet? Because like it should be. Right? <laughs> well, the first Cronus Rising is in negotiations with multiple producers Whoa. right now. The Slay book, which is not the same subject matter, I turned down the first option offer for it and so my agents continue to do her thing uh, but you know we'll see god willing from your lips to god's ears and to somebody's <laughs> somebody's checkbook you know? so so i'm i definitely want to read chronos rising because it sounds like right up my alley i am one of these people who though i started reading the meg series before the movie ever ever came out mm -hmm. 
but he took so long to get to like you're already you've you're past like how many i think he's only on book six or seven just came out and i held on to the second to last book until i definitely knew that the next one came out because I, I I feel like it's coming to an end. So now I'm excited because now I got to get through these two and start Kronos because um, <laughs> yeah, yeah right? I got I'm, a whole bunch of books to read now. I'm excited. Totally in. And I wasn't sure what the Kraken series was, but you know, the Kronos Rising Kraken. So now I know. And now I'm like, uh, I shouldn't skip all the other books right like i should yeah because, should i not do that so i just no, i should I, probably read them all right my suggestion is you read cronus rising first okay then you read cronus rising diablo see diablo okay. is like a prologue to cronus rising but it's there's spoilers a bit in there if you read it before cronus rising you'd be doing yourself a okay. disservice if you read diablo first i know it's got a beautiful cover and all that but uh, i was gonna say is diablo the one that's supposed to be kind of a more of a backstory before the first one am i crazy the well the prehistoric life in my novels originated on a in a caldera an oceanic caldera near the coast near cuba called diablo hence cronus rising diablo and the way that and i mean it's not going to ruin anything for you if, if you know this part because it's a minor spoiler but i try to create like i said a suspension of disbelief for my readers i mean things have been done to death in terms of how you have prehistoric monsters alive in the present. I mean, we've seen everything from the, what's called the Deadly Mantis, I think, and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms are both frozen in an iceberg or, or something like that. <laughs> yes. That melted. And then however, they survive frozen for millions of years and they're, they come out, okay? Uh, we've got ants <laughs> being in, enlarged by nuclear radiation. We've got, uh, you know, hidden the Lost World or Skull Island where you have this island or this plateau, you know, that's there like that. I mean, the Ocean Abyss thing has been done multiple times from Robin Brown, you know, for the Meg series, etc. Right. You know, those are, I mean, that's, you know, I wanted something where I didn't have to bend the rules to make it believable. How can you not only have a prehistoric species, which is a large animal, means you need a breeding population of these things. How can you have them surviving for 66 million years and then have them survive to the present and nobody's seen them? If you're going to have like megalon sharks living in the ocean abysses, that could work. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if there's a way you can pull that off. If you're going to have monster squid down there, obviously that that's real life, actually. Mm -hmm. you know, they apparently mm -hmm. exist, an octopi. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I was dealing with an air-breathing reptile, so you can't do that. So what I did was I set up a thing, and you'll see it in the backstory parts of the first Cronus Rising book, the Cretaceous flashbacks, where as the asteroid is approaching Earth, there is a these species, these creatures are called pliosaurs. And a pliosaur for the uninitiated is uh, <laughs> one of, if not the baddest super predator of all times. Picture like a 60 or 70 foot crocodile, but with a short tail which makes it significantly bigger because the tail is half the length. If the tail is a little stubby thing, the animal is much larger. And instead of four little legs, it's got four big flippers. So it can swim through the water at very high speed. That's what you're looking at. And we all know crocodiles have the highest bite force of any living animal, much stronger mm -hmm. than a great white shark or anything else like that. So mm -hmm. these animals, how was I going to have them survive? So I had it where there was a mating chase going on where there was a female that was in estrus, which means uh, in heat, and a bunch of males that were vying for her affection and competing against each other. As this asteroid hits, bam, a thousand miles away. When the asteroid hit, it created a tsunami a thousand meters high. So what I had was I had the entire section of ocean where these creatures were, including them, was swept up by the tsunami. And then this caldera, which was, I think, uh, like a thousand feet tall or something like that, gets swamped by this wave. It just grows right over it and keeps going. And it turns the caldera into a giant saltwater aquarium like that. And so you've got obviously a huge death toll, but you've got all this marine life, an entire ecosystem is now trapped in an eight mile wide, 10,000 foot deep saltwater fish tank. And the great thing about a caldera, even a semi-extinct volcano, is you have geothermal heating. So you're aquarium can be warm in the winter in impact winters as in caused by the asteroid as in ice ages etc so it was able to explain how the animals could have survived to the present and gave them a food supply as well so fast forward 65 66 million years and you know that's where we find ourselves but that's the that's basically the main backstory so what happens in diablo is there was an eruption that fractured part of that caldera wall and some 
not all of what was in there got out. So Diablo explains what happened, who or what was on that island as that happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of like a, I think somebody said it was a mixture of like Skull Island and Pompeii, something like that. I think that's a pretty good apropos description. Well, it sounds freaking cool, first of all. And then mm. I, I've heard you talk about, you know, how you went through the process of figuring out how this was going to work. And yeah, I love the idea of the caldera. I was like, that is so cool. Nobody, nobody's done. I was like, pretty cool. Very neat. I love it. It was a fun thing. I mean, it's sort of like Skull Island would be the reverse of that because the caldera is really a, like a fish tank. And right. I mean, I took some liberties of, you know, obviously having some rainforest around the edges, because when you have a wave like that, it's going to deposit sediments and things like that. And obviously, over time, you're going to have foliage. I mean, trees and plants get swept in from everything from driftwood to the wind or tide. Coconuts drift and come ashore and then they multiply and, you know, that type of stuff. So, I mean, that's all fine and well. But yeah, there was a, you'll see when you get the Kraken series, there's parts where people go back to the caldera to investigate and find some interesting things and uh i don't spoil anything for you but yeah but i would you know start off with cronus rising then do diablo plague is kind of like between diablo and the first kraken book but i would just do the kraken one two three or kraken one you can read plague either before or after kraken one that's up to you it's kind of like bridges the gap between what happens in paradise cove in book one and the kraken series which is 30 years later so there's a 30 year time jump that i give way too much I'm going to read all of these. <laughs> yeah. Wait, two more guys? I'll have like 19 readers. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I know you got way more than that. <laughs> I do. do I hear 20? <laughs> wasn't, come on, man. Wasn't Kronos Rising like a New York Times New York, bestseller? That was the New York Times, but it, it, it hit the bestseller list. Believe it or not, to this date, it continues to pop up on Amazon bestseller list. But that's because I think as the series continues, people, you know, see like the next book and they're like, wait, this is like book six or seven. Oh, I got to read everything. And then they go back and they buy the whole series, you see? And that's the secret to keep them buying and buying and buying. <laughs> oh my God, did I say that out loud? You must edit that out. But anyway. Cut so, that, cut that, uh, cut that. <laughs> but, you know, I get like people haunting me for the next book, you know? It's true though, because one of the things when I was in the seller side of it in the business and we always had our author you know book signings and i set all that up all the time the one thing that authors always say is you never ever stop selling the first book that you ever did even if it's not a series you still you still need to talk about it you still need to talk about the second one the third one the fourth one. i mean that's that's what brings people in so you're you're right <laughs> absolutely right spooky hey cord you look a bit upset there buddy what's up Ugh, I just want to relax under the soft light of a candle and read about Bigfoot, and I can't find anything that doesn't smell like I'm in the middle of a field of lavender. Well, bud, you need to check out the Smell of Fear Candle Company. The Smell of Fear caters to those of us who love all forms of horror, cryptids, and more. Ah, uh, the Sasquatch Candle. Smells like I'm right in the woods with them. Redwood and a hint of musk. Nice. Smell of Fear Candles offers a unique fragrance experience like no other. Each candle scent is carefully researched to bring out the best qualities of your favorite horror characters and films, such as The Mummy, Dracula, and even Jaws. Ooh, I'm definitely grabbing one of their Sinister Skull Candles. A colored glass skull with matching themes like Red for the Vampire, Black Current, and Absent Scented. Sweet. If you're in desperate need of ghoulishly good candles, head on over to thesmelloffear.com to check out what scents are currently available. You can follow on Instagram at smelloffearcandles for updates on new monthly scents and themes. That's Smell of Fear Candles for those who burn brightly on the dark side. A lot of people will focus on Megalodon existing. You talk about a particular creature that might actually be a little bit I don't know. I don't know if I would consider it worse, but it's pretty compelling. And that involves the 1969 eight millimeter film from Gary Liametta yeah. that I just discovered myself recently, thanks to your book. So I went and watched that several times. <laughs> you talk about how this creature, I'm not going to let you say it, might actually be responsible for quite a few historic sightings. And also, I was intrigued by the Pensacola Sea Monster incident that that might be responsible for that, too. Tell it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot to... You, you, you I know, right? Go. You have 10 minutes. Uh, I'm just kidding. 
I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. So Gary LaMotta and his friend Earl, both of them saw this creature in 1969. Now, I don't have all the paperwork in front of me and all that, so don't hold me you know, to the details specific. I'll try and keep it, I don't say vague, but I'll stick with it, the basics. They were both fishermen. I've interviewed a lot of people, so... Side note, the interviews in your book are amazing, and I like how you have them as transcripts, so it's really cool to read it that way. So what happened is these guys were fishermen, and they so there was a lot, some mistakes in the previous accounts. People thought that it was two guys on one boat and that Earl worked for Gary and that was not the case. They both had their own boats and they were separate. Um, Gary was in ahead of Earl that day in his boat and Gary had a Super 8 home movie camera. And back then that was like the iPhone of its day. So he was on a kick like as his widow told me that huge boxes of old, he would film everything. The dog, leaves, whatever and stuff. So um, he was out ahead, and he spotted this creature before Earl got there. And he was calling Earl on the walkie-talkie and screaming, Get here, now! There's a sea monster. I need you. Come, 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 come. And he started filming it while Earl was en route. And by the time Earl got there, the animal was still there, but it had submerged. And there was an underwater ledge that they had their boats above. And I think the water there was like maybe... 66 or 70 feet deep I'm guesstimating but the ledge came up and made it shallower like it was only maybe 40 feet deep or 30 something feet deep and so this animal was lying on top of this ledge and they were looking right down at it and Gary had passed away years ago but Earl was still with us and I got to speak with him at length I mean he told me everything how the day was the water what fish were running you name it I got it all I, I'm very thorough when I like pick people's brains mm -hmm. and especially since I'm a fisherman myself when you're on the water I want to know you know what the barometer was like what was running what were you using for bait what was your tackle I mean what kind of sonar <laughs> did you have I, I'm digging because I want to get to the truth of everything see and I found a lot of holes and stories with a lot of different sea monster sightings people I spoke to that nobody knows they're still alive until they read Monsters and Marine Mysteries so Earl told me at first he said when he was looking down at it he thought it was an enormous like sea lion or something like that because Gary's description was right Gary described it as a 38 foot long turtle that did not have a shell he said it had really large front flippers small rear flippers it was like shell it's like a leatherback but slimmer but it had a turtle's face and head etc and all that and it was a very pale color like pale gray or almost whitish Earl told me when he was looking down at it at first sight he thought it was like a gigantic pinniped but then he looked and he could see what it was. And it was this immense, almost white turtle-like thing. And it was as big as his boat. And these guys know their boats. And Earl's boat was exactly 38 feet long. And he said this thing was exactly the size of his boat. It was down there. It was just like sitting there. I don't know if it was eating or if it was resting. I mean, sea turtles do that all the time. They'll sit on the seabed. Sometimes they sleep there for six or eight hours, believe it or not. You know, it's like brumation almost. But anyway, so I said, were you worried? He goes, hell yeah, I was worried. He goes, why is it this thing? I was afraid he was going to get mad at me, come up and like flip my boat or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, so the interesting thing was, is like when I first heard this story, and before I spoke to Earl or anything like that, I saw the footage and it's so dark and grainy and it's so hard to make out. Like you could see there's something there, but it's almost a silhouette looking up and it, it looks like something organic. But I was like, what is that? You know, and like, you know, me and my pliosaurs, these creatures from my book, I was like, maybe that's the head of a pliosaur. And he was wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's got to be. They're still alive. You know? <laughs> I was trying to convince myself of this fantasy. <laughs> Seriously, you know, like it's a megalodon. It's going to be a megalodon, you know, let's call <laughs> all the meg authors and, all, you know, whatever, you know. But then I took the, some frames from it and I got um, Gary's widow gave me permission even to use them for the book. When I enhanced them, lightened them, it just jumped out at me. I was staring at the face of an immense turtle. And I was like, holy crap, he was right. I mean, he'd done a sketch of it himself, which was, you know, obviously he's not an artist, but, you know, his sketch was suggestive of a turtle, big beak, you know, receding chin, all this other stuff. And when I enhanced it, and I put it a frame in Monsters and Marine Mysteries, I mean, you can see, you could see the big bulgy eyes and the, the ridge of skin under the, each eye and above and the beak. And then you could see the, like, the weak chin and the ridges on the throat of skin coming down and all this stuff. And then when you watch the video and you, after you've seen the frame and you, now you know what you're looking at, it sort of jumps out at you. And you realize that this animal, it had its head and neck up out of the water. 
which is another thing turtles do, by the way, like spy hopping and cetaceans and stuff, and they look around. It was turned, and it looks right at Gary as he's filming it. And that's a little unnerving to me, because, you know, a 38-foot turtle, I mean, I estimate this thing weighed 16 or 20 tons, I think, in the book. And that's slim, based on slim sea lion proportions, okay? But is big enough to eat a 10-foot shark. I mean, just this thing's head and neck is 8 feet long. Picture that. That's big. And based on the speed... Yeah, like, like Gary said, and Earl said the same thing, that this thing was very fast. When they saw it take off, it just hauled ass underwater. I mean, it was capable, as Gary put it, he said, capable is a quote, of terrific speed, which suggests, and he saw it like chasing fish around and stuff. So I think they had like a salmon run going on when this thing was there. But uh, so this thing must be a piscivore. You know, it's carnivorous. It eats fish. So a big fish, obviously, sharks are probably high on the menu, you know, and tuna and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, if a human being fell in the water in front of one, I don't know that it would not be curious and consider a possible meal. I'm sure it would eat a sea lion or a seal. I mean, it's a big animal. So, But the Pensacola thing, when I was looking at that, and now this is, I'm not as up on the Pensacola thing. I only researched it for the book. But, uh, you know, the, the sole survivor, the witness of those boys, you know, the rest of them were drowned or taken by something, as the witness said. You know, the, the sole survivor, I don't remember his name, but he passed away years ago, unfortunately. So uh, I would have loved to have met him and talked to him and, you know, calmly, cons- you know, discuss the whole situation. But I, I think from the story is that five boys go out, like, on a little boat or a raft to see, like, a wreck, you know, that sticks up out of the water. Like, a, I think it's an old battleship or from, like, Yep. Yeah, like the 19, early 1900s. And then, like, some freak storm hits them, and then they're out there, and they end up in the water, and this some thing with, like, a big telephone pole-like neck and eyes looking down comes after them. And it, according to the witness report, it took several of the boys, grabbed them, dragged them under screaming, that type of stuff. Oh, wow. And he was a sole survivor. So I couldn't help but wonder based on the behavior of Gary's turtle, which we know happens because we have the film, see, if that could have been what these Pensacola boys saw. And, I mean, after Monsters and Marine Mysteries came out, I had somebody claim, now I don't know if he was telling the truth or not, I'm always worried people trying to hoax you and stuff, but I had a reader, oh, yeah. yeah, he he was telling me that um, him and his dad, this is when he was little, so I think this would be about 20 or 30 years ago, they were fishing off of a, there's a fort down there, like a military base. There's a pier down there that is near this military base, and he claims that they were fishing off this pier, and there was a guy that was shark fishing off the pier also, and he was catching like five, six-foot sharks with shark rod using steel leader and super heavy line, and he would lower bait down, hook a shark, and then crank it up, take a picture. I don't know if he was keeping it or not. He said he was letting them go and then throwing them back in. So according to this witness, he said that the guy's shark, something nailed it. And he said a turtle that sounds like the one I described, impossibly large. I I don't know how big this thing. I mean, he said this. I I have to check my notes. And I think I videotaped our, our interview, but it was like big like maybe 25 or 30 feet just a shell Whoa. So, and yeah he said it surfaced it took the shark like a five or six foot shark there's blood everywhere and then it ran off with it and he and it bit through the guy's line as it was swimming off biting through shark line is no yeah. joke yep i mean the turtle has a, a, has a beak that can do some serious damage some of yeah. them feed on a lot of like you know i mean i've had snapping turtles for pets and stuff but so i i mean that's what i he said now, I, I don't know if I am completely convinced by that or not. It's definitely an interesting story for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think it may be this Pensacola Pier. And it, maybe there's a Pensacola Naval Base or something down there. Maybe that's the name of it. And like I said, it, it was a couple years ago and it was a video interview and stuff. And the book was already out. You know, so, I mean, it's possible that, you know, I if you when you saw in, in, in the book, Kiki, I mean, there have been monster turtle sightings going back hundreds of years there is a naval base in pensacola yeah i think so i think mm-hmm. there's training a it's a training facility yeah, yeah i yes. think there's, mm-hmm. uh, there's a fishing pier or something near there called like pensacola pier I, th- I just find it interesting that if you look at these historical accounts there's numerous ones where people fishermen and other people encountered what they thought was a giant floating mass of garbage bags like black contractor bags and it turned out to be some sort of gigantic turtle looking thing where somebody <laughs> saw an enormous head peeking up out of the water looking at them there was another sighting in canada right in the same area later that year by the same type of creature 
that Gary and his friend saw. Almost exactly the same description. Could have been the same animal. But the turtle sightings go back hundreds of years. I put a couple of them in there from the 1800s, 1900s, and stuff like that. And they show these immense Chelonians out there in the ocean. Some are very pale in color. Did you see the one where they showed the spikes in the drawing, the historical yes. drawing and stuff? And how yes. I deduced what was really going on there? Yeah. You want, I mean, I don't know if you know if you're, uh, but okay. So, well, I was going to say, don't you listen, uh, people need to buy the book and read the okay. rest. Yeah. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting hyped for this book. It's supposed to come tomorrow. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> I want this book now. All right, so I'm going to stop because I give away this, this, the whole story. I mean, there's so much compelling evidence when you put it all together. Mm -hmm. I am a firm believer that first of number one, there are squid out there that are big enough to eat a whale. There appear to be octopi out there that might get as big as a bus. There are, I am 100% convinced we have sharks out there, carnivorous sharks that size, which I believe are white sharks that suffer from gigantism. And if people think that doesn't happen, it happens in many types of organisms. It happens to people sometimes. Yeah, yep. I actually like that theory more than saying that's a megalodon. When I, I've heard you talk about that yeah. before and I was like, I think that's vi like totally viable. Yeah. It makes sense. With the whole thought process of needing a breeding community and stuff, I think it would make more sense now that you say it about gigantism rather than having enough to have a breeding population of them. Yeah. When I was a kid, I, I put it in Monster Mirrors. I caught an insect that was like three times as big as a species is supposed to get. And it was the exact same species. And I wish I had it preserved to this day because it would have been a scientific oddity that would have blown people's minds. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was like, like ridiculous. But I mean, the American toad sometimes gets eight times its normal mass. So if you think about it, if you take like a white shark, we know white sharks can reach and exceed 20 feet. The bite marks that me and my guys have measured suggest they can top 25 feet on rare circumstances. But if we know they can do 20, and if gigantism doubles an animal's length, which it appears to, then that would explain what attacked that whale shark, what attacked that juvenile humpback that we're studying now. I mean, so much other stuff. And it would also explain why they're not everywhere, because if you're a 40-foot white shark, I mean, how long you're going to live, I don't know. But what are you going to mate with? Yeah. I mean, like they're size oriented. If you're a male white shark and you're that big, you're going to eat a female for lunch. And if you're a female, you're not going to accept any male suitor because when they mate, the male tends to grab the female by the neck and try and grapple her down to the seabed so they can copulate. Yeah, it's very violent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a 15 foot male ain't dragging a 40 foot female anywhere. Uh, he's going to be like you know, <laughs> the, next, the next meal, okay? I mean, that's just the way it's going to be. So those genes, if it was a mutated gene, would not be easily passed on. We wouldn't be looking at armies of super sharks everywhere all of a sudden overnight, etc. It would be a rare thing, but I, I think it's happening. Simon photographed this giant whale shark with this giant chunk out of it. And now we've got another one with a very, very similar bite. It could be the same animal. It's not outside the realm of reason if that does happen to great whites at times. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure getting you to be on our podcast. This is so exciting. And hopefully you'll come back because, yes, we have more questions. Uh, this is part of the problem with podcasting is you can't talk. Well, you could talk for six hours, but then some of us might not have husbands or wives anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, depending on the situation. So where can we find you and your products right now? Well, I don't go giving out my address because, you know, there's a lot of weird <laughs> out there. But, uh, good, on, good yeah, me and Cord, me and Cord. <laughs> uh, Kiki, has, Kiki has already spied on me on Google Maps. So. <laughs> hey, that's cool. <laughs> And moderately terrifying. Um, let's see. Oh, well, man. first off, I mean, if people want to go on my website, my official author site is either maxhawthorne.com, and that's Hawthorne with an E on the end, no impersonators. Um, mm -hmm. They can register. There's a monthly newsletter which puts out uh, sneak peeks and updates and lots of other goodies like that. So that's something. Uh, there's a gallery on there of paleo art, you know, like underwater, like prehistoric life and stuff like that. I promote artists on there as well. And there's also a free book section. If people want to get free downloads or stuff there, check out there too. So either maxwalthorn.com or cronusrising.com will bring you to the same spot. Um, on social media, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook under Max Hawthorne Author. 
And I think on Twitter, I think it's Max underscore Hawthorne. I don't really remember that one. That was a little weird. But anyway, but yeah, those are the way to find them. Um, the books you can order through the site or you can go on Amazon and they have everything from audibles to ebooks to hardcovers to soft covers, you know, all the usual stuff. But anyway, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's it. <laughs> I'm not used to selling myself. Um, did you mention the YouTube channel? Oh, no. Um, what's that called? That's a good question. And yeah, they keep changing the name on me. Hold on a second. Let me. Let me <laughs> yeah, I can never keep track. I swear. It's funny because I also believe it or not do songwriting on the side. So I wrote oh my a promotional. God. Yeah, I wrote a promotional song for the sleigh that's out now on YouTube, and it will be on the radio actually uh, in probably in a couple weeks, if that. But um, yeah, the YouTube channel is called Max Hawthorne's Book Trailers and Videos. Yeah, that's why I I do all, all the stuff because the, that would be something these guys would do to me. They'd be like, "Oh, we changed the YouTube channel name." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you, know, you can't like... find our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had this kids book that came out a couple years back called "I Want a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas." Oh man, I didn't know. I didn't know that. Now I have yeah. to buy that too. <laughs> how, how, old your, how old your boy? He's six. He's all. Oh, he'll be gonna, seven he's soon. He's going to love it. It's about a. a is he listening right now? He is not. He's upstairs having dinner. <laughs> okay. He. It's about a little boy whose dad is always away on business uh, for Christmas and stuff, and he's lonely, and he's bullied at school, and his iguana, quote, uh, ran away. And mm -hmm. um, he ends <laughs> up getting a baby Tyrannosaurus from the North Pole, which is causing trouble there. They give it to him for Christmas. <laughs> and, yeah, and over the Christmas break, it grows and grows and grows. And it's it's really cool. He rides it to the bus stop, and he puts the bullies in line on the back of his dinosaur, which is – the name is Tyron, as in Tyron Osaurus. Get it? Oh, uh, I love it. Yeah, and all that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then I wrote a song to go with it the following year, which came out last year called – a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas, and in yeah, I mean it's hard to break into the American tops here, but in the world indie charts, <laughs> like three weeks straight, it was the number two indie song in the world. Wow, yeah, it's a really cool song. I just mean, the next time you come on, I just have to also say the multi-talented, the multifaceted, <laughs> out of his mind, doesn't know what he's doing anymore. Okay, because he's got too much stuff going on. And when's the next book coming out, Max? How about that yeah. screenplay you promised me? And what if, you know, you're like, uh. Yeah, Max. I mean, yeah. I only have seven books to read first, but where's the eighth one, I guess? is Exactly. Yeah. Actually, it's in the work. Though. When are we getting Sea <laughs> Monsters on Broadway? When? When, when, when? <laughs> I, I picture a chorus line of, like, like bipedal octopi out there. <laughs> I kicking it and stuff like that, you know. Yep. Many, many Just... years ago, I, I, I dated a, uh, a rocket. So, you know, I, I have this thing. I want to see, like, all these octopuses doing the high kicks, you know, in a line. Uh, da, da, yes. da, 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 you know, Radio City Musical. <laughs> that be might great. be my Halloween costume for this year. I might just decide <laughs> to go as a giant octopus. <laughs> all right. Well, usually we sign off with the uh, stay spooky and don't die. But if you do, contact us. But we got something special because Max is going to do a reading from the new book, the sleigh which comes out on halloween just in time for my birthday heck yeah yeah hi uh, <laughs> so the sleigh is a horror thriller i mean technically it's also sci-fi but uh it is high paced it is suspenseful it is scary as all heck. It's also funny. You know, it's what a, a book should be. If you think you know a lot about Christmas, you're going to find out mm -hmm. you don't. And if you don't believe in Santa Claus, you may find out that you do. And most of all, for all my people that are used to my sea monsters in the water, if you think dry land is safe, it's not. The sun was a midnight memory when the cry rang out. It was high-pitched and breathless, and in its aftermath came a tinny grating sound, like metallic crepitus. No sooner had the noise faded when a dark and foreboding shadow filled the bedroom doorway. It wavered but a moment before starting forward, a phantom invading the little girl's room, weaving its way around an assortment of toys and other obstacles. Its behavior suggested both experience and precision, and the shade's owner took full advantage of the plush carpeting to pad its approach. Unaware of the intruder, 
the girl slept on, sheltered within her cocoon of soft blankets and fuzzy pajamas. Emboldened, the shadow crept closer, only to freeze as she shifted unexpectedly. It hesitated. The moment she did, it resumed its approach, drawing ever nearer, until finally its towering form loomed over the innocent child. It studied her intently. Her cherubic face was hard to make out, illuminated as it was by little more than a butterfly-shaped nightlight and the lone shaft of moonlight that struggled to pierce her room's tightly drawn blinds. The shadow inhaled sharply as the girl, perhaps detecting its proximity, began to flail. Eyes closed but arms extended beseechingly, she cried out once, twice, then sank back once more into her dreams. Oblivious to everything around her, she failed to detect the hand above her as it started to descend. Down it came, its fingers outstretched. It moved purposefully, passing first her, then her mattress, then her mahogany bed frame. All the way to the floor it went, until it reached its target, her unicorn-colored teddy bear. Strong yet supple fingers latched onto the lost treasure, hoisting it aloft. Then the hand began to rise. Its partner joined in and, through their combined efforts, the bear was placed gently against the little girl's chest. She sensed its presence immediately, delicate arms wrapped around it, and she hugged it tightly, smiling and sighing blissfully as she descended into a deeper and less troubled slumber. Stepping carefully back as he retreated toward the doorway, Dr. Donald McKinley smiled lovingly down at his sleeping daughter. Good night, Amy, he whispered, before softly closing her bedroom door. Oof, that was a close one, Don thought, one hand patting his heart while the other brushed a lock from his sweat-dampened brow. No, Mr. Sparkles, we almost had a nightmare on our hands. Grinning now, the relieved dad moved silently through his family's residence. He noticed that his wife Amanda was absent from her usual perch on the sofa, then remembered her mentioning she was going to take a shower. That was a few minutes before Amy called out. Don hesitated outside the doors to his study, his forehead creasing up. He considered going back in to review his notes for tomorrow's procedures one more time, but a glance at the hallway's aged grandfather clock quickly changed his mind. Losing any more sleep would be a moronic move on his part. It was late, and he had a full day ahead of him. He paused to roll out aching shoulders, then cricked his stiff neck from side to side. No worries. I could do those breast augmentations in my sleep. Well, except for the poor Reiner girls, he conceded. Fixing the disaster left behind by that Pakistani butcher she went to won't be easy. Dislodged implants is one thing, but the scarring left by the infections he caused is the worst I've ever seen. Still, I made her and her mom a promise, and I intend to keep it. Don exhaled through his nostrils as he carefully closed the doors to his study. He glanced up at his assorted degrees on a nearby wall, and gave himself a barely perceptible nod of self-acknowledgement. At age 44, he was one of the East Coast's most sought-after cosmetic surgeons. It was a reputation he'd earned with syringe and scalpel, and hands that many of his clients claimed possessed actual magic. He didn't know about the magic part, but getting to that point had been no mean feat. Coming as he had from an impoverished background had made things particularly challenging, and getting a medical school scholarship was nothing but a pipe dream. Undeterred, he'd gritted his teeth and seen things through. All the hard work, sleepless nights, and a veritable mountain of student loan debt had eventually paid off. He was at the top of his game now, and pulling in almost twice as much as a president of the United States. Well, an honest president at least. Don took pride in his hard-won success, but he made it a point to keep things in perspective. He'd learned early on that money had a way of changing people, and usually not for the better. He accepted that as a matter of course. But unlike many of his peers, he'd have managed to avoid falling victim to the cash cow apathy that accompanied their high-paying careers. He'd watched time and time again as they began to see their clients as dollar signs instead of people. He, on the other hand, always tried to focus on what drew him to his chosen field in the first place, using his God-given talents to improve the quality of his patients' lives. Inevitably, that brought to mind the one thing that never failed to infuriate him, the seemingly endless parade of cowboys that popped up hawking their wares while proclaiming themselves board certified plastic surgeons and taking advantage of people's trust often with disastrous results. Plastic. Don shook his head in disgust. The word was sadly apropos. There were times when, while wading through the aftermath of their incompetence, 
he found himself wondering if half of those charlatans had honed their so-called skills by practicing on actual Barbie dolls. It was no wonder his malpractice premiums were so exorbitant. His face flushed, and he found himself wondering if he was being a tad hypocritical. After all, a large chunk of his business came from salvaging what others had ruined. Granted, it felt good making things right, but it was difficult looking into the distraught and distrusting eyes of people whose noses, chins, or chests ended up looking like they'd spent their formative years skinny dipping in the waters around Fukushima. Of course, rebuilding and reshaping the human body was where he shined. To hear his parents tell it, it was in his DNA and always had been. Don paused outside the living room, running his fingers contemplatively along a section of their home's ornate crown molding and relishing the intricacies of its smooth, shorn edges. He remembered how, as a child, his room had always been littered with blocks of clay and worked and reworked tubs of Play-Doh. He'd always had a passion for creating. He loved making and shaping faces and figures, everything from his parents and pets to his favorite superheroes and anime characters. He'd fantasized that one day he'd become a renowned sculptor like Michelangelo. Ironically, he had, except that instead of working with lifeless marble or bronze, he was carving people, their outsides and, to hear them say it, in some instances, their souls. He couldn't understand what was wrong with so many of his colleagues. His work was something he could never become apathetic about. He found it more than just rewarding. He reveled in it. And why shouldn't he? He was in the business of changing lives. When it came to his, or anyone else's face or form, Don had a simple philosophy. Everyone had what he considered to be a sacred duty to take care of themselves. That included not just engaging in proper nutrition and exercise, but also making sure to avoid pitfalls such as tobacco and recreational drugs like the plague. It was only natural. As he told his clients, our bodies are the vehicles that carry us through life. In fact, they are the only things that we really, truly own. Short of killing us, they are the one thing no one can take from us. What we see when we look in the mirror each day has a direct impact on how we feel about ourselves and how the world responds to us. Therefore, we owe it to ourselves, our spouses, and our children and grandchildren to always be the best we can be, both physically and spiritually. Chuckling as he realized he was giving himself the same lecture he gave his patients, Don entered their spacious living room. He looked around and smiled. Christmas Eve was just a few days away. As usual, their residence was adorned in full holiday regalia. The illuminated garlands, faux fur trimmed oversized stockings, and a bedazzled nine-foot blue spruce topped with a blazing five-point star. It was like a scene from a holiday picture postcard. As Amy put it, Christmas was when, for a few weeks each year, their boring old house got to look like Santa's workshop. She was right. Don looked up, taking in the living room's soaring ceiling and the huge blackwood beams that supported it like buttresses in a cathedral. He let slip a sigh of contentment that rivaled his daughters. He had to admit, the way things were going, he and his family must be blessed. There was no other explanation for it. In just eight years, they'd gone from a modest two-bedroom apartment in Rutherford, New Jersey to an upper-class Manhattan residence that looked like a magazine spread shot in Old Town Prague. A huge, loft-style apartment with hand-wrought suspended light fixtures, elegantly framed floor-to-ceiling windows, and polished sandalwood floors that both looked and smelled divine. The white walls, coupled with an abundance of sunlight, offset the dark ceiling timbers and kept the place ceiling light and airy. Combined with its tasteful decor, it literally oozed comfort and style. Everyone who visited their home went gaga, something his wife never tired of. True, buying a place like that on Central Park South, no less, was a major investment. In fact, it represented a substantial portion of the family's combined savings. When Don had first heard the price, he balked. He felt it was simply too much too soon. That was, until they toured the property, took in the views, and, of course, laid eyes on the fireplace. Amanda fell in love with the outsized angle the moment she saw it. After an initial inspection, Don couldn't blame her. At a full six feet in width and nearly as high, the antique French Rococo statuary fireplace had been flawlessly crafted from a single block of ivory marble. Its ornate paneled frieze and bracketed jams were adorned with woven trails of flowers and vines and offset a spectacular serpentine-shaped opening trimmed with exquisite beading. Topping all of that was a custom-shaped shelf with inlaid egg molding. The antique hearth was clearly the result of hundreds of hours of toiling by a master craftsman, a labor of love the talented surgeon could truly relate to. 
After that, acquiring the property was a foregone conclusion. Of course, the fireplace had to be upgraded from wood to gas. Don loved the traditional fire, but had no time for such things. Once the work was complete, it was the perfect centerpiece for their home, not to mention the ideal location for the pricey flat screen that hung directly above it. Don's expression grew grim as his eyes lifted from the fireplace's comforting flames to the muted TV. There was a news broadcast on discussing the previous night's Manhattan murder spree. The victims, a well-to-do family, had been found butchered in their beds. The culprits were a gang of maniacal cultists, and a member of the victim's immediate family was apparently one of them. At least, that's what the media was claiming. Of course, with those guys, you never knew. On a glance back toward their high windows, out of the darkness beyond, his insiders started wearing his lower lip, then his stubborn streak kicked in, and he tamped down on his burgeoning paranoia. He was being illogical. There was nothing to be concerned about. They were in a private building, protected by armed guards, and warded by more security cameras than most banks. Not to mention, there was no fire escape, and they were five stories up. Don scoffed as he clicked off the set and returned the remote to its tray. There was nothing to worry about. Of course they'd be fine. He knew that. Still, the uneasiness remained. He frowned as his inability to shake the feeling and headed into the master bedroom to get ready for bed. He could hear the shower still running in the master bath and wrapped his knuckles hard against the door. Honey, can I come in? To his surprise, the door was slightly ajar and opened a few inches from the force of his knock. Hun, are you in here? When no reply was forthcoming, Don opened the door enough that he could peek in. Babe, are you? His words morphed into a startled gasp, and he flung the door the rest of the way open. The glass door to their shower was wide open, and water was spraying out onto the bathroom's tiled floor. Far more concerning, however, was what was on the floor. Don nearly took a header on the wet tiles as he rushed into the steamy room. Steadying himself, he dropped down onto one knee and reached down to confirm that his eyes weren't playing tricks on him. They weren't. There was a discarded towel on the floor. It had a series of foot-long rents in it and was stained with blood. A lot of blood. Amanda! Head snapping up, Don lunged for the door handles of his and his wife's matching toilet rooms. Yanking both open, his head whipped from side to side like a windshield wiper. He expected to find her inside one room or the other, perhaps struggling with the sudden onset of an unusually heavy menstrual flow which should explain the bleeding, or God forbid, she might be having a miscarriage. Of course, Don conceded, there was nothing in their history together that suggested either of those circumstances was at all likely, but they were the only safe possibilities his science-minded brain could come up with. He was wrong. Both rooms were empty. His wife wasn't there. All he had was an abandoned shower and a ruined towel and blood. Not just on the towel either, he realized. It was all over the floor, too. He hadn't noticed it at first, because the steam and spray had diluted it. In fact, upon closer inspection, he discovered there was a trail of it. Don's eyes turned to hen's eggs as he espied the pinkish footprints leading to the bathroom door. They were Amanda's. From the look of things, there had been a struggle, after which she'd been dragged or perhaps carried out. He looked closer and swore silently. It was another track mixed in with hers. It was a partial heel print of some kind, a big one. Don ground his molars in an effort to clamp down on the fear that sought to unnerve him. They had an intruder. There was someone in the house, and whoever it was, he had Amanda. Hey, Spooksters. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Mission Spooky. Big thank you to Max Hawthorne for giving us a reading of his new book, which comes out in about a week. It comes out on Halloween. That's called The Slay. It is a horror book. Thank you once again to Scott over at Horror House. That song that we used to the background is called Negative Ascension, and that is off his album called La Pisadera, and that is available on Bandcamp. We have played another song off that album called Ghost of it is a really cool ambient goth soundtrack. We love it. And once again, a very big thank you to our sponsor, Smell of Fear Candle Company. Make sure you go to smellofearcandles.com and check out any of her new scents that are available. She's added quite a few for October. You'll notice on Instagram that I already bought my two, which were my Godzilla one. Thank you. And uh, Basic Witch. I'm not sure if those are available right now, but she uh, has a an email that you can sign up to for when they are, quote, resurrected. As always, thank you so much. Stay spooky and don't die. But if you do contact us. Uh, Preferably send one of those rockets dressed up as an octopus.